Good morning. Hope you guys survived the rain last night. We have a little rain. Actually, we have a lot of rain, a lot of water in our basement, so that'll be a fun afternoon. So come on over after lunch if you guys want. And we'll work on the basement. Hey, you may have heard the last recorded words. I'll probably take you back here. Everyone probably knows exactly where they were. If you were living in this moment, then you probably remember September 11th. 2001, those last words recorded of Todd Beamer, one of the passengers on that United Airlines flight, Flight 93, when attempting, you remember the story, attempting to storm the, co the cockpit to retake the plane from those hijackers, and those words were just simply, you guys ready? Let's roll. Do you remember that? Let's roll. You may have heard of Spike Milligan. He's a British comic. I read a little bit about Spike Milligan this week. He was also a musician and quite funny in his writings and in his last moment. As a matter of fact, the last recorded words of Spike Milligan to his family were, I told you I was ill. <laughs> and then he passed just a few moments later and his family actually had those words uh, placed on, inscribed there on his gravestone. And then there's the music legend icon Jimi Hendrix. His final words were actually written in a note left on a desk next to his bed, and he simply said this, the story of life is quicker than the blink of an eye. Then there's the last words of Leonardo da Vinci, who said this, interestingly. Of course, we know da Vinci is the artist who painted The Last Supper in Mona Lisa. Having known that, it's quite interesting, his last words. He said this, I have offended God and all of mankind because my work never reached the quality it should have. Interesting words. Then there's Steve Jobs, the co-founder of Apple. Most of us in this room have been impacted, probably all of us in some way, by the genius of Steve Jobs. His final words, actually spoken with just a few of his family members by his side, are the words, oh, wow. Oh, wow. Three times, oh, wow. Bing Cosby, after playing 18 holes of golf, by the way, his doctor only told him to play nine holes of golf that day, but he played 18 holes of golf, and right before suffering a fatal heart attack, he said, that was a great game of golf, fellers. And then there's Charles Schultz. I'm a big Charles Schultz fan. His final words, he's the creator of the Peanuts comic strip, of course. He died on February 12th, the year 2000. He said this, Charlie, Snoopy, Linus, and Lucy, how will I ever forget you? Then there's a man by the name of Grover Redding. You've probably never heard of Grover Redding before. I read a little bit about those who, whose lives ultimately cost them for their crimes. Then they were executed. Grover Redding was executed a little over 100 years ago. And right before he was to be hung for his crimes, he said this, I have something to say, but not at this time. <laughs> I found that to be quite humorous. I want you to think about this this morning, guys, as it relates to not a morbid moment, but just a moment in reality when, of course, Jesus, that crucial moment, those final moments on the cross, we've looked at a variety of, of his words. And I want you to think about this as we wrap this series this morning. If before dying, think about this, if before dying, you could choose your last words, think about this, what would you say? If before dying you could choose your last words, what would you say? Our Savior Jesus obviously lived a perfect life, a sinless life, went to the, cr the cross for all of humanity, died for you and died for me. And as we've been studying for six weeks now, while on the cross he made seven statements. Could have said anything, but what he has said we have seen has been quite remarkable and impactful in, in our lives. We've examined six of these statements. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they were doing. Today you will be with me in paradise, that promise of eternity. Woman, here is your son. And to the disciple, here is your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I am thirsty. Last week we looked at those three words. It is finished. And today, if you have your Bible with you, Luke chapter 23 is where we are going to be. We spent a lot of time in the book of John. We're going back to Luke. We, back to Luke. we began this series in Luke, and we're going to look at the final statement that Jesus made today, equally 
powerful. So glad you're here. Good morning. My name is Jeffrey Smith, and we're so honored that you would worship with us. For those joining online, I'm one of the pastors here, and we count it a privilege every day to be in the Lord's house. And what a series this has been. Seven statements that our Savior made while on the cross. We're going to look at the final one today, Luke uh, chapter 23. Let's jump into verse 44. It says this, it was about noon and darkness came over the entire land until three in the afternoon, for the sun had stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. Let's look at this again. It was noon, darkness came over the whole land until about three in the afternoon. The sun had stopped shining. The curtain of the temple was torn. That's going to be a a great study for us. We're not going to talk or unpack that particular sentence, though a powerful one it is. The curtain of the temple was torn in two, and Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Guys, you know this. Jesus did everything that he came to do. Everything he wanted to accomplish, he did during his time on earth. He didn't miss an, a, a thing. There wasn't something he wished he could go back if he were given a do-over. Jesus didn't need a do-over, lived a perfect life, lived a sinless life. And he knew, and we've seen this over the last six weeks, he knew the only way to bring completion to his time on earth and to forever conquer sin and death meant that he, everybody say only he, he, only he could go to the cross. So he went. And while on the cross, Jesus said everything he wanted to say, he accomplished all that he needed to accomplish. As Kristen reminded us just a few moments ago, it was just one week earlier where Jesus triumphantly entered Jerusalem. The, the, the cheers of the people. Look at John real quickly. Look at John before I give you a couple things to really think about this morning. John chapter 12. Let's, let's just look at this passage just, just briefly. Uh, Kristen read it for us, but this is Palm Sunday and the Sunday before Jesus was crucified. And, and look at these words again recorded in John, John chapter 12. This was a week before Jesus would go to the cross. The next day, this is verse 12 in John chapter 12. The next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. So they took palm branches and they went out to meet him and they shouted, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. Everybody say amen. amen. Blessed is the king of Israel. Of Israel. Guys, this passage that we uh, see here with Jesus entering, just a few words here, really whetting our appetites for, for what is about to come in, in one week in the life of Jesus. And he is celebrated triumphantly. He arrives into Jerusalem. They are praising him. They are shouting Hosanna. One week later, it would be that Jesus would say these words recorded that we just read here in Luke. His final statement on the cross, Father, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Wow, what a passage in one sentence. Guys, there's so much that I want to I give you today. This, this, this statement that Jesus makes of, of surrendering, committing his life to his Father, the, the, the choices that Jesus made, the ultimate life that of perfection that he lived, and now he's come to this place having accomplished everything. And he says, Father, I will now commit my spirit into your hands. I thought about this this week. I'm going to give you a couple things to write this morning, guys, but before we get to that, I just want you to think about just the power of our hands. Just, just If you would for a moment, just take a look at your hands. I think we take for granted the, the beauty all the Lord has given us. If there's one in the room who's lost use of a hand or, or part of your hand in some way, you you know the impact that, that your hand or not having your hand as you would desire it. I have crazy arthritis in, in both of my hands, but in one in particular, and I've been told that surgery is the only option and it's about a nine-month recovery, so I just don't want to go there. So this hand gives me trouble all the time to where oftentimes I can't even open a, a jar and it just, it, it just makes me furious sometimes when I think about my hand and I'm reading these words of, of Jesus and I, I, for some reason the Lord just drew me to this idea of of hands, and I want you to think about this statement that of all the words Jesus could have used, he uses this statement of into your hands. My spirit is, is being committed. Look at Matthew 26, 
real quickly. We, I think we see a connection here to what, what Jesus is saying. Jesus is about to be arrested. And interestingly, once again, he uses the word hands. I'll put it on the screen for you. You don't, you don't have to go there if, if you don't want. And, uh, we're just going to briefly look at this. But Matthew 26, verse 45 says, Then he returned to his disciples. He is in the Garden of Gethsemane. He's about to be arrested. And look at what he says. Are you still sleeping and resting? Look, the hour has come. The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. The power of hands. We know that right after this moment, wicked hands arrested Jesus. Wicked hands betrayed him. Wicked hands lied about him. Wicked hands put him through a mockery of a trial. Wicked hands put a crown of, of thorns on his head. Wicked hands beat him. They shoved him. Wicked hands spit at him. And wicked hands ultimately drove nails into his body. And now, here we see in Luke 23, Jesus on the cross. And he's praying, Father, into your hands. I commit my spirit. If you're writing, this isn't, I'm going to give you three things this morning. But this isn't one of the three. But I would love for you to write this. Because it really spoke to me this week. Jesus' life, if you're writing, write this. Jesus' life is proof that when I place my life into the Father's hands, I can accomplish much. Jesus' life, guys, is proof that when I place my life into the Father's hands, I can accomplish much. I hope you take that home with you today. Even if you didn't write it, I hope you've inscribed it on uh, the, 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 the door of your heart and that you would just allow that to sit there this morning, that you will think about this, that you will enter into this, this, this journey this week of thinking about what does it mean one day, listen to me, one choice, one challenge, one temptation at a time to rest in the Father's hands. Because this is where He wants us. This is what He desires of us. We see that He speaks of hands when He's being betrayed. And then we see ultimately the power of the hands He speaks of, the Father's hands, when He breathes His last. And into the Father's hands, He commits His Spirit. Hey guys, here's a promise from God. The moment, listen, if you're a Christ follower, I hope you'll smile when I say this this morning. But the moment you take your last breath, your Father in heaven awaits with hands ready to receive you. It's the promise of salvation. Amen, church? It is a promise of salvation. These hands, again, I've thought about this this week. Uh, interesting, Friday, Chris Eads, I don't know if Chris is in the room or not, but, but Chris was, was here. Uh, he's here somewhere. So I, I, he's right. There. Good morning, Chris. Good to see you, buddy. All right. Uh, Chris, I, I didn't get your permission, but I'm going to say this. He came over to do a little work for us uh, Friday, and I, I just love Mr. Chris, and I love his heart, and we're, we're about to get going out here, and he, and he stopped me, and he said, Jeffrey, he said, I want to tell you something. And he basically just told me the story of his life and what, what God has done in, in the ups and the challenges and re re relationship challenges and just challenges of being a man and, and, and celebrations, and he's smiling as he's talking. And, and, then, and then he says this, and, and it hit me, because uh, here's what we're going in Scripture. He said, you know, Jeffrey, every day... And he took his hands and he put them together. He said, Jeffrey, every day I bow my head, I put my hands together. And I just thank the Lord for his goodness. And I think, you know, we, we take our hands and we, we often, we, we pray and we teach little kiddos to pray in such a way. And this really isn't where we're, we're going in Scripture. But I just feel like the Lord has laid it on my heart to just give it to you. And then we're going to rock and I'm going to give you three things. And I, I, I want us to pause for a moment and just to think about the power of God's hands. And when we allow his hands to lead ours, what we can accomplish as people. When we allow his hands to, to lead us. I did a little research because I just had to know this idea of folding your hands and praying, it originates to hundreds actually of years ago when prisoners would be shackled. Their hands would be tied together by ropes and they would actually be led in this, this walk of submission either to a court or to a hanging to a jail cell, and it would be this, this way of, of telling the prisoner, hey, you don't have any rights, and they've been taken from you, and it's no longer you, but others controlling your life. And isn't this really when we, when we pray, whether it be a gesture here internally or here, as Chris mentioned, with our hands, of the power of saying, God, it's not my life, it's yours, and I want you to lead me, as if my hands are tired, tied and you're, you're, you're leading the way. Chris, I, I loved that reminder. Guys, let me give you some stuff this morning. For six weeks, we have been studying these words of Jesus 
And I got to tell you, the, the study has really forced me to think about my life and my choices and, and how I live and what I say and what I do. And I want to end this series this morning and triumphantly head to Easter uh, next Sunday by, by giving you three conclusion statements. And the first is this, if you're writing. You can follow along also in the app. These three points are there for you. But number one, when I think about all that these words have brought me to and who I'm to be as it relates to taking my hands and placing them, my entirety, placing them into the hands of the Father. Number one, live like this is my last day. And we see the final words of Jesus and everything he said was so powerful. And even until his final moment on his last day. I love this idea of thinking about what it means every day to live like it's my last day. Have you ever thought about this? It's not a morbid message this morning. I don't want this just, just to be um, a cute saying. I really want you, because the three sentences I'm going to give you to write can just sound kind of flippant and cute, like I came up with something cute to say. That I, I don't want this to be a cute moment. I want this to be a heart moment for you because it's been for me this week. But I want you to think about what does it mean to live like this is truly my last day. I mean, it really takes us to a place of really considering every, if you allow your mind to go here, every aspect of our lives, how I spend my money, how I treat my neighbors, what I watch on TV, what I do when nobody is looking, the words I use, how I handle pressure, how I deal with anger, how I face temptation. What if we really had the mindset that we see in Jesus here, even up until the final moment of his last day before dying on a cross, he was all about, all about the Father's will. What does that look like to live like this is my last day? And it also leads us to consider this. Jesus' last day was brutal. Christians, it sure does remind me that just because I'm a Christ follower and I live in America and I have a job and I, I, I drive a car and I've got a bank account and I eat in nice restaurants and I've got friends I do life with and I enjoy my music, all these blessings that life brings us, it reminds me that, that, that realizing that living like it matters in my last day, living like it is my last day, very well could mean that I don't get what I want. And it could be painful. Jesus' last day was extremely painful. So I want you to have this family focus this week. We love to give you a focus every week to think about. We hope you're taking advantage of this. All the family focuses are, are on the app. Uh, but Brendan, put up that family focus this week if you can find it there. I love this idea of just thinking about and talking about if I knew today was my last day to live, would I live any different than I'm now living? Think about this. If, 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 if today was it, and I knew today was it, would I, would I change something? Would I, would I really face life differently? I mean, I think of all the people that I love, all the people I love to spend time with, that I, I hope I, I would be with them, maybe make a, a final call to them or have an afternoon with them or, or maybe be floating out uh, on Old Hickory in a boat or even better in the Gulf in a boat or maybe having, of course, an iced tea in my hand or here, this would be super great for me, a final meal at the back porch in Destin. I mean, that's a home run for me. I can't, I can't imagine the sun in my face. I think about the things I enjoy and I would love to enjoy these final moments. But guys, I, I want to take you because I've taken myself deeper than just that surface stuff this week as, as I thought about this. Because again, this moment in history that we're looking at right here in Luke 23 and in John 19 and the other passages that we've unpacked that Jesus has said in his final moments on the cross, this was a horrific moment for Jesus. It wasn't a feel-good final moment. Of all the moments in history, no one endured what Jesus endured here. And if I'm truly going to live as Jesus, shouldn't my last days really push me to consider being beyond just me? Beyond just what I desire, what I want life to be, what I want family to be, what I want church to be, what I want whatever to be. Galatians 2.20 says it like this. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. If you're a Christ follower, Galatians reminds us. Listen to it again. I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live. But Christ lives in me, according to this verse, as a Christ follower, I don't even live anymore. And is this convicting to you? It's convicting to me this week, guys. 
As a Christ follower, Scripture is telling us, we really don't even live. In these final words of Jesus before dying, man, we see that it was all about the Father's will. It, this was all about the Father's will. His final words prove to us that he accomplished the Father's will. Now, as, as you think about his final words, it led me to think about, okay, what are the first words of Jesus? Have you ever thought about this? What, what are Jesus' first recorded words in the Bible? Do you know? Look quickly at Luke chapter 2. It's very interesting because we see this pattern in Jesus' life. From moment one, we, we don't know his first words, obviously, but we do have the first recorded words of Jesus in the Bible. And it's when, it's the story when he travels with his family for the festival of the Passover. This is Luke chapter 2. And it says in verse 41 that every year Jesus' parents went to Jerusalem, festival of the Passover. When he was 12 years old, so Jesus is 12 years old, the first recorded words of Jesus, 12 years old. They went up to the festival according to the custom. After the fest, according to the custom, after the festival was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they traveled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. And when they did not find him, I can't imagine what that must have been like for his, his parents. They went back to Jerusalem to look for him. And after three days, they found him in the temple court, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. And his mother said to him, son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have been anxiously searching for you. Here are the first words recorded of Jesus in the Bible. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? Hey, if you haven't underlined this passage, this would be a great moment to do so. Specifically, the three words had to be. That really stood out to me this week. But here we see a 12-year-old boy. From early on in his life, he understands his had to be. He understands the business of his father. And so it makes sense to us that Jesus, having lived this life about the had to be, of course then, we, we see him here on the cross and we hear his final words and quite fitting they are, into your hands I commit my spirit. Hey, if you're writing, you should write this this morning. Guys, living like this is my last day, is about understanding my had to be. It really is. Let me ask you, are you living in your had to be? Don't blow past this. I know I still got two more points. Packing a lot in here this morning, guys. Focus on this moment right here. Ask yourself, am I living in my had to be? Am I truly zoned in? Uh, not just about what I desire, but about what God wants in my life. Am I about that had to be? I know this is probably a... A greater, longer, deeper conversation would be a great, a great series for us at, at some point as it relates to really being on point when it comes to our purpose and our mission. But I want to give you three quick questions that might can help you continue this conversation in your family or with the Lord this week. What does it mean to be in the had, had to be? And how do I know uh, I'm on point with God? How would I know? How do I really know I'm about His mission? Well, here's, here's three sentences, three questions that you can answer and think about this week. Number one, am I fulfilled? Write down this question, am I fulfilled? Number two, can I say that my life purpose is greater than my position, my career, my status, my retirement? Can I say that my purpose is greater than my position? And here's one more. Do I have joy? Not am I happy. Not do I, do I get all I want. Do I have more good days than bad days? No, do I, do I have joy? Because we all know we're in, living in one right now. There are tremendous moments of challenge as, as humans. But even in the midst of such moments, we can have true joy when we're living in the had to be. We see from a 12-year-old boy, and Jesus understood the had to be. Live like this is my last day. Secondly, speak. It's an important one. Speak like this is my last word. Man, words matter, don't they? Speak like this is my last word. Look back at Luke chapter 23. You know, your spirit is the highest 
and it's the deepest and it's the most intimate part of you. And we see Jesus address his spirit, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. The power of his words, words really matter. It got me thinking this week, okay, where did the spirit of Jesus go after his death? Because some people say, and I even have some friends who believe that Jesus went to hell. He took on the sins of everyone. And so Jesus actually went to hell and he paid the price in hell. But scripture tells us otherwise. The words of Jesus, because words matter, the words of Jesus tell us otherwise. Look at chapter 23 up just a few verses from where we are. Jesus is speaking to one of the criminals being crucified alongside of him. And Jesus answers this criminal... In verse 43, and Jesus says, truly I tell you, today, everybody say today. Today you will be with me in paradise. Some might want to believe otherwise, but Scripture confirms God is always right. What he says is true. And Jesus tells us right here in Luke chapter 23, verse 43, that he is going to be in heaven that day. Now, let me ask you this, guys. We, we kind of covered this earlier, but since, since it's brought us back here, let's just, let's just quickly remind ourselves. Why did the criminal in the first place believe in Jesus? I mean, he's hanging on a cross. It's the natural assumption that Jesus hanging next to him is guilty of whatever crime he's been condemned to die for. So how does this criminal, we also studied a few weeks ago, you probably remember, uh, that Matthew reminded us that the criminal is actually mocking Jesus. Earlier on in the crucifixion process, he's, he's mocking. Both the criminals are mocking Jesus. But now we see, we hear this criminal, a change of heart. What happened? Well, what happened, once again, words matter. Look at verse 34. The criminal hears Jesus praying for the ones killing him. And Jesus prays in verse 34, Luke chapter 24. Father, forgive them for they do not know what they're doing the criminal hears the words of jesus while in agony while bleeding in those final moments of his life and we see because of jesus's words a life is changed hey will you answer this question this morning the question is this do my words ask yourself do my words point people to Or point people away from heaven. Think about this question. Do my words point people to or point people away from heaven? Words matter. Let's let scripture do the talking for a moment. Psalm 19 verse 14 says, let the words of my mouth... The meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Psalm 141 verse 3 says, set a guard over my mouth, Lord. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Proverbs 10 verse 19 says, too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. Proverbs 12, 18, the words of the reckless pierce like swords, but the tongue of the wise brings healing. Proverbs 13, 3, the one who guards his mouth preserves his life. The one who opens wide his mouth, or rather his lips, comes to ruin. And listen to this one, Proverbs 18, 21. The tongue has the power of life and death. Proverbs 21, verse 23 says, watch your tongue, keep your mouth shut, and you'll stay out of trouble. I need to remember that one. That's a good one for me. Matthew 15, 11, It's not what goes into your math- mouth that defiles you. You are defiled by the words that come out of your mouth. Matthew 12, verse 36, I tell you, listen to this, I tell you that every careless word that people speak, this one's tough, every careless word that people speak, they shall give an account for it on the day of judgment. What do all these passages have in common, guys? Words matter. My words matter. And I think, as I put some thought into it this week, I'm sure you would agree with me, I think sometimes we believe when there's been an injustice, when we believe we've been wronged, or when we just want to win the fight, or when we don't like what we're seeing, or we don't appreciate what someone's doing, right or wrong, 
when our feelings get involved and our emotions get awry, we, I think we believe that speaking what's on our mind will just make us feel better. And sometimes it will. But let me ask you, is this what Jesus did? Because he could have said anything while on the cross. He could have done anything. He could have made his situation better. But instead, he only spoke what was of the Father. I think there are times that we just need to remind ourselves that, you know what, yeah, saying what's on my mind make, might make me feel better. But it doesn't always change the situation. And sometimes it changes the situation for the worse. I remember uh, several years ago, uh, an employee uh, who was working for our ministry, and uh, I and this employee didn't see a particular situation in the same way. And whether this employee was right or I was right isn't even a part of the conversation today. What I, what I do remember is that I just wanted to speak my mind. And I spoke my mind. And it didn't change the situation, but it did drive us further apart. And our relationship since then hasn't quite been what it was previous. Man, I I take the blame for that. I said what I wanted to say, and man, as quickly as I said it, I had even rehearsed, I'd made some notes, and I, I, I was ready to rock, and I, I kind of had a, a pretty good delivery, but as quick as as my lips finished those words and the zinger went in, I knew, I knew, not only was it not going to change the situation, it's probably going to make it worse. I guess I want to remind you that words matter. Proverbs 15, verse 28, just listen to this. The heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. The heart of the godly thinks carefully before speaking. I sure want to encourage you to think carefully before you speak. Because Jesus sure did. Because again, think about it. Everybody that day got it wrong but Jesus. Jesus could have stopped the whole process. He could have corrected them all. He could have corrected those who betrayed him, those who falsely accused him, those who condemned him, those who mocked him. They got it all wrong and he could have told them so. But he didn't. Jesus only did, and he only said in those final moments of his life, that which was aligned with the Father's will. Guys, what if we began to do the same? I mean, truly, what if we really began, started thinking, truly thinking before we speak? And listen, I, I, I know this isn't easy. I, I'll, I'll admit this. I, I know it to be true. You know, some of... Some of the decisions that have been made here on this campus since I've become pastor haven't been popular. I, I know that. And I know some of the decisions the ministry team, specifically me as leading the ministry team, have made haven't been probably what have been made in the past. I, I, I know this. And some things that, that we've started doing a little differently aren't, aren't textbook and maybe aren't the way that they've been done before and some of the, the language we use and some of the, the look that we use, some of the things that we've done, maybe they feel differently, they sound differently, of course they, they look differently. I, I, I get this. And so I, I know that for those who might not quite agree with those changes and choices, church could be a little uncomfortable for you. I want you to hear from me, that's not my intention. My intention above all else is to be about the Father's will. I don't always get it right, but I'm sure striving to get it right. But here's my challenge to us all. Of course, conversations can always happen. In my door, you guys know this. I'm in a conversation just about every day with, with someone, and I love moments where we can talk about our church. And even if we don't agree, we can get better because at the, at the end of the day, I believe your heart is like my heart, and we just want to reach the lost. Amen, church? But here's my challenge to you. Here, here, here's my challenge as your pastor. I want you to write down this question. And the question is this. Can this change a life? Will you write down that question? Can this change a life? 
I want to challenge all of us because this, this is a question I'm asking myself often when it comes to change implementation or a new approach in ministry here. Before I even take it to our ministry team, I'm pausing, I'm considering, I'm praying over this, and I'm asking the Lord to lead me. Is this decision we're about to make, can it change a life in our community? And we pulled the plug on some decisions, and we've, we've made some decisions that still are, are, are a little iffy, but I can tell you this. We haven't, as a ministry team, made any decision when we've asked the question, can this change a life, and the answer has been no. And so my challenge to you, whether you like it, whether you want it, whether it sits well with you, here's what I'm going to ask you as your pastor, that if you will pray about what you see happening here on this campus, and if you have been led to believe that no, what they're asking of us to do as a church won't change a life, isn't biblical, isn't ethical, I hope you'll come and tell us, I hope you'll run to us and tell us, because we don't want to step in any wrong direction. But if you do believe as we are leading on this campus, that yes, I may not like that. It may not fit with me. It may not be my style. I might not have worded that sign that way. But I do believe it could change a life. And then, guys, here's what I'm also going to ask of you when we write this. Speak up, not down, about Donaldson first. Speak up, not down about Donaldson first, because listen, words matter. Words in the parking lot matter. Words over a cup of coffee matter. Man, I've been hit sideways this week thinking about my words and the things I've said through my life and the conversations I've been a part of. And I'll tell you, I'm, I'm the first in the room to admit it. I don't always, Amy will tell you this, I don't always speak up. I often speak down and I gotta get better at this. So the mirror is before me today. And we see the words of Jesus, how powerful they are, and lives were changed, and that's who we want to be on this campus. And our words matter. And it may just feel like a word or a comment to get off my mind and make me feel better, but man, we don't know when somebody hears something we say the impact it's going to have on them. I will tell you this, it's so exciting when I think about it. There's a couple that came to our church just last week. They haven't been in church as far as I know in years, possibly, possibly 10 plus years, and they came because God's doing big on our campus. I know there's a guy who came to church here last week, never been to church here, joined last week because God's doing big on this campus. Last week when we finished our service, there's a lady who walked down front and she's in a relationship that's less than pleasing to God and she's working through that. And her fiance is not a believer, but she came down front and said, Jeffrey, I want to give my life to the Lord. And we prayed right here and she's going to get baptized in two weeks because God's doing big on our campus, guys. Change is happening on our campus. And I believe it, man, if we will be about living like this is our last day and speaking like this is our last day, and finally this, will you write this down? Love like this is my last act. I believe we're going to see God do supernatural stuff on our campus, stuff that we've never seen before, stuff that we're not even expecting he's going to do. He's going to do so much more if we truly are about not us, but about him, not about our desires, but about his, not about our comforts, but about his. Listen, it's going to push all of us. It's going to push all of us to places that maybe we've never wanted to go before or we've never thought church should go before. But listen, I do believe this. I know this to be true. If our prayer will be about, Father, show us how to love like this is our last act, I guarantee you he's going to show us. I guarantee you he's going to show us. Jesus' last act of love on the cross changed everything. And guys, listen, when we stand before the Father, when that, listen, when that, when that day is over for each of us on planet Earth and we stand before the Father, I know it's your desire. It is my desire. I can't wait to hear those words. What are those words? Well done, good and faithful servant. Man, let's let that be our driving force. As we think about how we live, how we speak, and how we love. Amen. Will you bow your heads with me this morning?